Near the end of World War II, the Nazis came up with a radically new idea for a fighter plane. One that was powered by jet engines. This new technology could perhaps give the Nazis the edge against the Allied air forces and maybe even win them the war. Flying just below supersonic and piloted by the best German aces, the Mi-262 would be unstoppable. There was simply nothing to match this Wunderwaffe. But Hitler's decisions and wrong expectations stopped this jet from turning the tide of war. This is the story of the first jet fighter, the Messerschmitt 262. Ironically, our story begins with the Treaty of Versailles. You see, this unfair treaty, in air quotes, was to blame for the rise of German jet development. After World War I, this treaty was signed banning Germans from further development of piston engines. But there was no talk about new technologies like using rocket or jet engines. This pushed the German engineers into a direction of creating an alternative, yet superior, type of fighter plane. Heinkel was the first to start working on his design along with von Ohain with his He-178, which was the first turbojet aircraft to take to the skies just a week before the kickoff of World War II. On the other hand, British engineer Frank Whittle had also worked on a jet engine as a new propulsion method, but the British government didn't take him seriously at the time. And this gave the Germans a big advantage. Now I bet you're watching this and wondering, what would it be like to fly? Well, you can on today's video sponsor, War Thunder. Don't fast forward on that timeline because I'm inviting you to come and play with me and fly some of the craziest aircraft ever built in War Thunder, a free online military vehicle combat game. War Thunder features over 2,000 different land, sea and air machines from 1920s to the Cold War that you can fly, drive and cruise to challenge yourself to be better than the aces of the past. My favourite so far being the P400. And there are updates every few months with more content, like one that dropped featuring the Soviet MiG-29 and the F-16A Fighting Falcon. You can play solo missions, or my favourite, in huge air battles with over 100 different maps. That's right, huge battles that we can all play together. We played a few months ago and it was the most chaos I've ever seen in a match and I can't wait to do it again. I'm still very much a beginner in the game so you have a great chance to save me from other players. Or if you really want, shoot me down. Like everyone else did last time. When you make an account with my link, you'll get a free bonus premium tank, aircraft and ship, as well as a boost to your account. The game's free to play across all platforms, PC, PlayStation and Xbox, and you can cross-play with anybody on any other device, so you don't need anything. A keyboard and a mouse on the basic PC will run it. So no excuse to not make an account with my link, do the tutorial and come and play with me next time. It's going to be an absolute blast I know. I'll add the details of how to find each other in the description down below. After the war started and initial German successes, RLM, or the Nazi Ministry of Aviation, shifted their focus to aircraft they already had in service instead of working on this new jet technology. Because well, if it works, why change it? However, Heinkel pushed forward with his design building the He-280, but Willy Messerschmitt also took interest in this new jet engine technology and soon enough he proposed a new fighter known as Project 1065 just before the war started. You see, both Heinkel and Messerschmitt were brilliant engineers, but Heinkel didn't know how to play by the rules and didn't have the political backing the same way Messerschmitt did. This resulted in Hitler himself being impressed with this new jet technology, giving Messerschmitt essentially carte blanche in accepting any design that he could guarantee to be a feasible one. By 1942, the Mi-262 had its first flight, and in 1943, legendary ace Adolf Golland flew the aircraft himself, being impressed by the performance and stating, this is not a step forward, this is a leap forward. Everything was set for this new jet to become the backbone of the Luftwaffe. 
and let the Nazi Empire to strike back stronger than ever before. The most fascinating part of the Mi-262 was its design. It was very ahead of its time. Its requirements stated that it needed to reach a speed of 850 kilometers per hour, but actually doing service, pilots reported that they surpassed 900 kilometers per hour. The wings were swept back 18.5 degrees to move the center of gravity and accommodate large and heavy jet engines in pods under the wings. Also, they would allow for lower drag and a better maximum speed. On the downside, however, this swept wing design had issues at lower speeds, especially on takeoff, which would allow allies to exploit it later, but I'll get back to that in a minute. It was armed with four 30mm MK-108 cannons, which would allow it for downing pretty much any bomber or plane in a single burst. Propulsion would be provided by two turbojet Yunkers, 004 engines, and they would be the first operational axial compressor engines in the world. However, they would also become one of the main issues for this jet fighter. The first variant of the jet was called the Schwab, or Swallow, was a fighter interceptor, and this was exactly what it was designed to do. But things started to unravel when Misha Schmidt showed off this prototype fighter to the big bad himself. Hitler had other plans which would prove to be one of the fatal issues for the future of the Mi-262 program, and perhaps even the loss of German airspace itself. With the intimate Allied invasion of France, Hitler thought that the best role for this new wonder weapon would be fast deep strikes into Allied territory, dropping bombs over France and perhaps even into England. Although it was completely a stupid idea, especially for a fighter jet, not a bomber aircraft, Messerschmitt still went with it and ordered fighter production to be drastically reduced and a new bomber version to be designed. This new variant was called the, and again, I'm really trying here, the Sturmvogel, or Stormbird, and it was developed but completely blocked the future development of the fighter variant. And this is when all the issues started to pop up and the engineers weren't around to fix them. D-Day arrived and the Germans were unable to stop the Allies on the ground, nor build this new attack variant in time. And that's when Hitler got mad. Nein, 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 nein. In his rage, he issued a direct order to completely stop any fighter production and instead just pump out the attack bomber variant. In spite of that, the Luftwaffe started training pilots on the previously delivered fighters and they were to be piloted by the very best of the best. Conversion from a FW-190 or BF-109 to a Mi-262 was not a hard task because the Mi-262 was a very capable and flyable aircraft. However, it was easy for the aces, but manpower was the actual issue in 1944. Young pilots without too much experience were getting put into this brand new jet fighter because they didn't have anybody else. And the result went pretty much as expected. Many pilots were killed in all sorts of crazy accidents during training, and then they would be going up against the best of the best allied pilots who had plenty of real world experience. But eventually these rookies got into fighter squadrons and were actually deployed on the battlefield. At first the Mi-262 was an absolute game changer. The allies didn't even know what hit them. It was successful against fighters, bombers and pretty much anything. But soon enough, the Allied pilots would start to use a new tactic to counter this threat, and this became a huge thorn in the design of the aircraft. You see, the main issue with the Junkers Yumo 004 engines were the materials it was built out of. Because of the blockade and the inability to acquire rare and expensive materials, they were built out of steel which could not handle either the heat or the wear and tear in an axle compression engine. The Germans knew that nickel alloy was to be the solution, but the only problem is they couldn't access it. 
So these engines were plagued with reliability problems and would have to be frequently serviced even in the heat of battle. Another problem was that the production itself. The factories were constantly bombed by both the Soviets and Allies, and they would actually have to move the production of the Mi-262 to tunnels, underground facilities, and even forests, where they would have to assemble the aircraft by hand. But in spite of all these issues, over 1,400 were built by the end of the war. A lot, but not nearly enough to change anything on the front lines. It turns out that there were several design flaws that would be the ace in the hole in its destruction. Allied fighter pilots would find out that the best way to counter the Mi-262 was during takeoff or landing. As these planes were rising up to the sky, they would not be able to gain speed fast enough, meaning their main advantage was out. Many were also destroyed on the ground because raids were focused on airfields where these jets were spotted during recon missions. They decided to hit them hard on the ground before they could get up to speed. Whilst in the sky, inexperienced pilots would often make mistakes and it would cost them their lives. And American pilots flying P-51s found out that if they could somehow get into a dive or a downward spiral with the Mi-262 during a dogfight, they would be able to catch up with it. But this wasn't the only issue with the plane. As the war ended in May of 1945, many Mi-262s were left all around Germany and they were the top prize for both the Americans, British and Soviets to further develop their own aircraft. Many late 40s and other jet pioneer designs would be based off experiences with the Mi-262 and although that it never had an impact on the war itself, it entered history as the first operational jet fighter. Legendary and a beautiful design that we can still admire today. I'll be covering more crazy Nazi designs in the future, so don't forget to comment about what you would like to see. And thanks so much for watching, and I'll catch you in the next Found and Explained video.